I believe I don't believe in lucky sevens I'm not sure about loveness But I know I believe in angels I believe in happiness Good evening and welcome to the Caffeinated Cooper Show. I am here with Greg Allison, which is known as Green Greg's on YouTube as well as GreenGregs.com. I've got a little intro here, so usually I'm not looking at the person while I'm reading the intro and you're in the green room, but he is right here live, so he gets to react to the intro that I've been able to piece together. Basically, a lot of what I've watched on YouTube and from GreenGregs.com, and if you're just listening to it, it's gr E E N G R E G S dot com. So Greg Allison is the founder of Green Greg's Worm Farm and GreenGregs.com. And he is an educator within the realm of gardening and survival education via his podcast. His farm offers the finest composting worms for gardening, mostly red worms, with some blues and Alabama jumpers mixed in. His worms are great for composting, pet food, fishing bait, and much more. Greg has been in the worm business for 10 years. He's also the founder of his YouTube podcast, which has millions of views and subscribers since 2014. He also offers a lot of educational videos on his website. Additionally, he covers many other topics too, such as chemical-free gardening, aquaponics, microgreens, wild edibles, and medicinals. And I particularly love the videos on prepping, and that would be survival tactics. So welcome to the show, Greg Allison. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm fantastic. So I want to know, how did you become a worm farmer? <laughs> well, Let's start there. I started with a simple question, you know, I, you know, my day job is government contracting and even though I've been on this current job that I'm on now for almost 19 years, it's had a history of instability and it's all at the realm of politics. And prior to this job, it would be like, you know, two years, one year, four years, it would be very sporadic and it's all, you know, you never know what the budget's going to do. So I asked myself a simple question. And that was, how can I make a living on my own two legs, on my own two acres? And that was one question. But the other thing was, I had gotten interested in growing an organic garden because I started studying more and more about the junk that's in the food we get. And I thought, you know, I, I need to be growing my own food and it needs to be clean food. Of course, today, I, I'm really worried that we're about food security, food availability, and food prices shooting through the roof. So there's a whole lot more impetus to grow a garden today than there was when I got into it. But you know, this this whole notion of worm farming serves both ends of that because with a worm farm, what I can do is I can grow a garden without having to go to a store to buy supplies, which also fits within the realm of prepping. I mean, if uh, if the if the you know what hits the fan. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are in a situation where there may not be any stores. You need to have your own food. You need to be able to provide it. Well, most people are used to going and maybe buying plants and setting them out. You know, sometimes I still do that, but I don't have to. Or they, they will, uh, uh, you know, they got to go buy ber uh, fertilizer. They will buy pesticides. They will buy all this chemical stuff. Well, you're not going to have that available. The good thing about worm farming is that worms uh, provide you the products you need without all that chemical stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. for example, worm castings are the best fertilizer you'll ever find. They are Mother Nature's own time release nutrient pills. You know, Miracle Grow sells time release. So Mother Nature had, mm -hmm. had Miracle Grow beat from the get go, from the very beginning, from the inception. Yeah. 
The beautiful thing about a worm casting, the worm casting is a little bitty worm food. Because the worm has mucus in its digestive tract, that dissolves slowly over time, releasing the mucus at just the right rate for your plants. Unlike cow manure, horse manure, a lot of other manures that will burn your plants up or, or, or fertilizers if you over fertilize, you can plant plants directly, seed starters, or, or, or you know, you can put out plants or, 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 or plant seeds directly in worm castings. And that plant will grow fast and beautiful. It will love it. It'll, be, it'll, it'll blow your mind how well that plant will grow. Uh, and another product I make is worm tea. Worm tea is brewed specifically to increase the bacteriological uh, content or even the fungal content uh, within the brew, which you apply to the soil. Any book on organic gardening should start out, with, it should be paragraph one, uh, uh, sentence one. It should, the very first thing should be, Good soil is living soil because soil is the basis of all you're growing. If you go out in Mother Nature, what you're going to see is there's no big birds flying over the forest spraying things to make things grow. It all occurs in the soil because the soil is alive and it's interconnected with bacteria and fungal uh, uh, networks. The, the fungal networks uh, form uh, uh, mycelium and they form dendritic networks like the neurons in your brain. And they'll Bacteria will break down nutrients to make them more readily available to plant roots, but the fungal networks will actually transmit that to your plant, move it to your plant. But see, plants also live in symbiotic relationship, and they say thank you to the fungus and bacteria by putting sugars out through their roots to feed those. So the plants are, are feed them. But in what we do in our in our industrial farming and gardening world is that yards and everything is that we we apply many things that kill the the natural network in the soil start with fertilizers a lot of people don't know those fertilizers kill that stuff fertilizers uh the uh pesticides the herbicides the uh and the way we kill we destroy our soil we destroy the living networks that are in it and the plants are still putting the sugars out but they're wasting them they're really trying to feed something that's not there when there's something there to give them back it actually makes them grow more. So that's an investment to them. It's kind of like a, a human being and investing in something that's going to pay you back over time. You see, that pays back to the plant. But the plant is trying to invest in it, but it's putting it out into nothing. And so it becomes a waste, unfortunately. So if you've got the, the, the bacterial culture in the soil, if you've got the mycelium in the soil, they will feed that plant uh, without even fertilizing. They will feed the plant from the nutrients in the soil. They'll break them down and make them more readily available to the plant roots. And that plant will grow like crazy. So, uh, you know, the NPK content of, say, like worm tea doesn't matter because it's the bacterial that works. Now, uh, I actually uh, cheat and use uh, aquaponics water in my worm tea, which does give it a slight NPK characteristic. And... Uh, so to brew worm tea, what I do is I take a, a, a tea bag made out of worm casting because it's got the bacteria in the worm casting, and I put it inside of it. Now, my, my tea bags are uh, sandbags, <laughs> a little bit large for a tea bag. Now, for a smaller brews, you can use smaller tea bags, okay, like a five-gallon bucket with maybe a uh, pantyhose leg in a stocking leg or something like that would work just fine with full of worm castings. But I brew in a 58-gallon barrel pickle barrel, olive barrel most often. And sometimes I brew in 250 gallon uh, IBC tote. And I might use a couple of the sandbags in that case. But you drop the sandbag into the brew and it only has to stand there really for 24 hours for it to pick up the bacterial content. Some of the nutrient content too will also go into it. So what you do is you put it in the water and you put a blower in and you put a, it's got to blow a lot of air. I mean, it's got to just roil with air bubbles. What that does is it promotes the growth of aerobic oxygen loving bacteria, not the stinking anaerobic stuff. And now some people do want anaerobic solutions for certain applications, but you know, you gotta be careful what you're doing with that. So, but I, this is what I encourage you, it's the easiest most people to deal with. And it don't stink, <laughs> believe it or not. You know, it's made with worm poop, and worm poop don't stink, believe it or not. So the cool thing is that, uh, that, that you feed a molasses to make these back to, to simulate these sugars that plants are putting in the roots, uh, roots are putting in the soil, put molasses in there. And the molasses also has a benefit 
of, of having a certain amount of nutrients like iron and things like that. Some people actually put molasses in the gardens. So by doing this, you're actually providing molasses to your garden. You're providing some of the nutrients that were in the, the worm castings, but you're you're brewing a bacterial mix. And uh, it needs to brew for at least 24 hours. Uh, you know, I, I live brew all week long, you know, sometimes for several weeks or months even. Now, sometimes it, the brew will go bad. It might get, uh, it might get uh, vinegar or it might go anaerobic. If it's got a bad smell to it or it smells like vinegar, throw it away. Start over. Clean your barrels up. Sanitize everything. You got to sanitize it very good because you don't want the bacteria that causes that. But, you know, so that's what I do. And the cool thing about worm tea is it, it brings, you put it in the soil, it brings the soil to life. It puts the microbes in the soil that uh, break down the soil, make it more readily available to the plant roots. There's some of that worm castings, but worm tea is concentrated. A thimble full of worm tea has 100,000 different species of beneficial bacteria. 100,000 species. And because there's such a broad spectrum of this, it has many beneficial effects and also some fungal particles which can form the mycelium networks. So, so it feeds the plants when you put it in the soil, but when you spray it on the plant leaves, it has other beautiful effects. It, it does things like it inhibits the formation of rust, mold. It, it deters, it, it actually kills some of the soft bodied worms and insects and deters other insects from biting your plants. Probably not squash bugs, but you have to have some other techniques for dealing with squash bugs. I'm going to cover that future too. But, uh, or, you know, what, what I call it referred to as stink bugs. But the, uh, but it, it, it and, and, and you might even mix in a little bacteria thuringiensis to help fight worms more effectively, kind of, you know, amp up the top bacteria that are in it. So there's different things you can do like that to amp your brew up. But the, 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 the bottom line is you shouldn't have to go to the store to buy any, anything, really. Now, you, you know, you, know, you still want to go through the garden and, and inspect things and pick things off, make sure you look, you know, look for corn worms and your tomatoes and things like that, or the little green worms, say, on your beans, leaves. But so there's a lot you can do that, mm -hmm. that you shouldn't have to, in a grid down situation, go to the store. In fact, what you need to do is grow heirloom seeds, or, yes. which, or which is also known as open air pollinated seeds. Seeds that, uh, these kind of seeds, if you save them from your plant after you harvest the plant and you replant them, you get the same plant back. A lot of your seeds that you buy in the stores today are hybrid seeds, especially tomatoes. It gives you a beautiful big fruit. <clears throat> but when you take those seeds, it's good for one time out, but for the next year, no. You don't want to get back a different tomato plant than what you just had. So, uh, but there are heirloom seeds that didn't produce beautiful tomatoes. So I would choose to plant as much of that as possible so that you could uh, replenish your garden for the following years. And because seeds are going to be extremely valuable in a grid down situation. Like uh, if you're carrying uh, a can of food, this stuff here is, is um, it's big, it's large, it's only two servings. You know how much, how much food you can produce from a couple of little seeds? You know, you get a plant going and you can just keep producing. And the right. seeds are small. You can carry them easily. In fact, I got a video where I talk about how the Indians during the American Indians, during the uh, Trail of Tears, sowed the seeds in the garments to hide them. So they could uh, take them out of, you know, the, the, all their stuff was being stolen from them. And mm -hmm. so, so they could keep them and preserve their seeds and sow them into the garments. And unfortunately, and a lot of people died on that trail. And when someone died, the uh, natives removed the garments. And the, the, the troops thought that was uh, very primitive and bad. And, you know, they looked down on, on them for it, but they didn't realize that their life was in those garments. They, they had no choice. They didn't want to do it. They thought it was barbaric. And they probably thought so too. They probably hated it, but they were trying to save their lives. That was their, right. their future was in those seeds they had to hide in the garments. And that's how they kept themselves going when they got to their destination in Oklahoma, places like that. So that's a sad story, but it tells you how valuable seeds are. And if you go to my my YouTube channels, my YouTube videos, most of it, sometimes I don't post links on a live video I do, but when I upload a video, I will post links. And one of the things I post links to is a truly market where you can get heirloom seeds. 
And, you know, I have other weeks I post to for other things, including long-term food storage. But, and which I think is important, you know, the one thing you have to worry about is if we have a nuclear war, you may have to wait a few years before you plant your seeds if we have a nuclear winter as part of it. Or there right. could be other climate uh, adversities that might hit us. Uh, 12,500 years ago, a comet hit what was believed to be the Laurentide Ice Sheet, which covered North America, and it caused a very cold, dry period known as the Younger Dryas. And I believe uh, the year 535 or somewhere along there, uh, there was a, a, a very cold summer that wiped out a lot of crops because of uh, Krakatoa blew up in Indonesia. And it really probably precipitated the fall of the Roman Empire and a lot of other empires in America and in, in the whole world. Uh, mm -hmm. And then when there was the, the volcano of Tambor exploded in I believe 1816, I believe 1817, the following year was known as the year without a summer. And uh, people of New England started to death. That's why a lot of them moved to the Midwest. It really was in impediments to people moving in and settling the Midwest. And even here in the South, it said that we had frost in, I believe, June or July. So, oh, goodness. So, I think people of today are just not prepared for that whatsoever. That would cause absolute pandemonium. I do have a question. So you had mentioned you're on two acres of land right. and you have a pickle, pickle barrel is the size that you brew your worm tea for. So as you had mentioned, you can use it as a spray, an antifungal spray and all types of things for on topically on the plant but then it also goes in the soil. And my question for you is how much yield of that do you need for oh, your- you don't, need, you don't, the regular uh, gardener doesn't need anything more than five gallon bucket. I, I, I sell the worm tea. That's why I grew it, uh, brew it in larger pots. I sell it, you know, it's a product I sell. It, for my own personal purposes, I wouldn't brew, brew any more than five gallons. Five gallons, I mean, you want, if you go around and spray this stuff on, on your leaves and, and put the balance of it in your soil, bang, you got it. You're covered. Uh, I wouldn't spray it directly on a fruit just because, you know, it is a bacterial uh, substance. And in, in any event, I do also wash my fruits off with vinegar. So, you know, is as a uh, disinfectant. You know, it's just, you know, part of my hygiene protocols that I follow. And when I, like, if I harvest grow lettuce, I wash them in vinegar also. Uh, because it is a disinfectant. So it's just a good way to play it safe. Uh, Can we take a look at your website where you do sell, you sell the worms yes. and you sell the worm tea. Can we take a look at that real quick? This, so this is greengregs.com and we're speaking with Greg Allison and he is going to show us the website as to everything he offers here. So you have, um, oh my goodness. So. So I started this website originally just to sell worms. I sell the worm tea and worm cats as local. This is for worms I ship, basically. But I am starting some local things on this website, like micro living microgreens. I sell microgreens, too. And I grow these. And originally, I started growing these in my living room. But I'm growing, growing them in a trailer right now. So that's me and my microgreens trailer. If you see my mm -hmm. microgreens uh, videos on my YouTube channel, most of those are filmed either in my li uh, living room where I was growing them or in my kitchen where I was planting them. So this is the first uh, first worm bed really is a plywood box. Just a, this is just a eight by four foot sheet of plywood on the bottom and top with another sheet cut in half the size and half another sheet cut to the end, screwed together on a uh, concrete blocks with a little bit more in the back so it'd have a slope holes down here covered with the screen wire to drain out and i was catching i was actually for a while brewing my worm teeth and the leach it that leads through the uh uh beds but i, I mean you can do that but i do use the tea bag approach now so okay. what you can see here is oh yeah here's testimonial down here from people mm -hmm. that bought worms from me this is from their own postings i found them uh, actually, I went in Google, so most of these found them that way. But people would put a, a YouTube video out there when they, uh, I know a couple of these people. I know this guy, that's, he has a uh, YouTube channel called Oppenheimer a Ranch Project. Mm -hmm. This guy here is called Top Now. He's actually his place, but he did a video on his own getting the worms. 
uh, this guy's got a YouTube. Most of these guys, he's got a pretty good YouTube channel too. Mm -hmm. um, so you can check out other YouTube channels and some of these videos. And you can see I ship them in these little sandbags like that. So uh, those customers are all quite happy. And, and are they expensive? Uh, well, let me see. I'll go over here to the buy ones. I think my prices are quite competitive with other people right now. Worms have gone up in price. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, postage has gone up a lot, and it's just been a lot of drivers that drove, drove the price. You can get a half pound for uh, $37, a pound for $49. I might pop it up just a little bit. I suppose it's just gone up since I have uh, posted these. Right now, these buttons are disabled. If you click them, it won't go all the way through the purchase. This button's still enabled, though. When I start reselling worms, probably in June, most likely late June, I will re-enable these buttons right now. And there's a note up here just telling you due to technical problems and my worms just not been as mature. Really, it's the number that I have that is, is the issue. I'm, I'm waiting until I, I've got to have all my beds full. And I did a video of that on my channel explaining that just the last, I posted it last week, I think. So just and, a few days ago, in fact. So, so how fast do worms reproduce? Worms can double in population every two to three months. Oh, so, wow. So that's the red one. The red worm reproduces fast. The night crawlers are a lot slower to reproduce. So uh, that's, and red worms can be grown outdoors. That's why I prefer red worms. Uh, so, this it gives you, you know, some contact information and other things. And this is my logo here. See, it's a <laughs> fish made out of worms and with lease for the garden and GG for green gregs. As I sell worms, I've got an aquaponic system. That's why you got the fish. <laughs> I love it. So I, I cover many things. So my latest has been microgreens. This is, a, and I've actually built in the house to grow mushrooms in a mushroom building. So I hope to be doing mushrooms in not too different, distant future. These are uh, uh, purple radishes up here. They're known as Rambo purple radish. And you can send me purple radish, broccoli. Uh, you get your slothora thing and the broccoli, which has got enormous health benefits. You know, sunflower shoots, uh, Thai basil, kale. And we grow other varieties too. That's just This is just a sampling of some of the things that go pea tendrils. And I love eating pea tendrils and sunflower shoots. They're so yummy. Uh, they're all yummy. Uh, and it just tells you how microgreens are up to, four, up to 40 times more nutritious than a full-grown plant, for example. Now, we're right now selling these through pre-orders, but we're going, and, and, you, and you'll see those off through my Facebook site. If you click that, it'll take you to the Facebook page. Uh, but uh so those are local sales, and I will I do sell worms local, but I haven't really marked this page to account for that. I probably will update that uh, to this in the future. And I get going to things like why well, raise red worms? Like if you want to raise them yourself, and it does have a few of my videos in here. And this is talking about really from the standpoint of profitability, how you can really raise as much uh, worm meat as you can have usable meat in a from a steer in a year off of uh, a plot of land just eight by 24 feet as opposed to an acre it might require to raise a steer <laughs> so you know what i said what what can i do on my own two feet on my own two acres and so this goes to some of the benefits of it for uh, uh general facts for composting for your garden if you want to fish or go in the worm business and here I looked at, you know, we were going into quarantine there a little bit when we started the bug out. So I, look, I, I did a video examining worm farming as a quarantine business. <laughs> uh, so here is how to raise worms. Uh, this video is my most popular video on my website, by the way. And I get referred to as Worm Gandalf for some of the commenters there. So. Uh, for you so for the average let's just say average size um backyard garden you know square foot gardening let's say that you have a 15 by 15 foot square foot garden what is the quantity of worms that you would want to 
put into the soil for that type of space? Well, you know, it, it, for, a, for a garden that size, you might start with, well, you put a pound would be more than enough for that. But what you might do is start with something uh, like a square of uh, those, uh, uh, what do you call it, can of worms or the, uh, what's the other name for them? There's a, a stackable worm beds you can buy. And the names mm -hmm. are leaving me at the moment. I'm getting brain locked. It's, uh, keep, we call them a worm farm. They're, uh, those things are, uh, would probably raise enough worms and produce enough castings for you, uh, for a small guard. Just off and use your kitchen waste to feed the worms, basically. Um, mm -hmm. that would probably be quite sufficient because, because they double every, uh, two to three months, you just take the excess worms and put them in your garden. Mm -hmm. uh, so, do it. And that would probably be about the right scale for a small garden. If you're gardening big time, uh, you know, a good sized garden, you'd want to use uh, a few uh, of the Walmart totes. Uh, so let me uh, let me go here to this video. This is called Worms Videos. Okay. And I've organized this page here of what you need to know first and progressively as you need to know it. It doesn't have every video here, but it's got most of my worm videos are on this page. So it's got the basics, and these are all from my YouTube channel. So this is the, the intro in the worms. Uh, you need to know what's covering because it tells you how not to kill your worms, which is most people make the mistake when they the first get the worms of overfeeding them. There's a lot of YouTube videos out there that misinform people on how to raise worms. And here what I'm showing a video. Yeah. A lot of YouTubers are just out producing videos just to produce videos, I believe. I, some of that stuff is garbage, I feel like. Uh, right. So here is uh, how to, to build worm beds. Here I'm putting one inside the other, and that's uh -huh. the technique I prefer. Now, one of these is actually a short one, uh, but it don't have to be. So uh, I'm showing you how to, to use just these things you buy at Walmart. And I got another video that does that too. And here I'm showing you some quick ways to do worm casting. I'm just using a, uh, a metal file folder I got from uh, Office Max or someplace like that and showing me how to uh, separate the worm castings out of here. So it's a free worm bin. Oh, yeah, the free worm bin is actually a kitty litter box. <laughs> huh. Here I show where I've taken IBC totes and cut them in half and I built sled runners on the bottom. And I've uh, invented uh, the sled bed worm bed. <laughs> and I'm, you want to hear some music? Sure. Let's see here. Two through the mud, and one tractor open sleigh. Over the weeds we go, a laughing all the way. Embers on land all green, making my pages bright. Oh, how fun it is to laugh and sing. A sledding song tonight. Oh, wiggle worms, wiggle worms, wiggle all the way. Oh, how fun it is to ride in a one tractor open sleigh. Hey! <laughs> That's great, great. Sleigh. <laughs> Over the weeds we go, a laughing all the way. <laughs> so, what do you feed a worm? Hang on, let me stop this. Oh, wiggle worm, wiggle. What was the question now? No, so what do you feed a worm? What I feed a worm? Well, that's covered yeah. in these videos too. Oh, yeah, by the way, uh, the, uh, the two acre farm is really big. You can do a lot on a smaller farm. Mm -hmm. This is uh, one of two videos I did with the family from Pasadena, California. It lives in a big city. And on a tenth of an acre, their DeVace family, uh, their dad just recently passed away. They used to grow enough food there to feed a family of four. And they made a living from that tenth of an acre in their backyard. So uh, that, uh, the only thing they didn't raise there was the grain products they ate. But I've got another video I did with another friend, uh, Jason Avers, where we talk about growing a balanced meal to feed a family of four off a tenth of an acre. So it's amazing what you can accomplish with yeah, a garden yeah. if you if you uh, are careful about oh yeah here this is a five gallon bucket worm tea brew here by the way so let me end this video here i got to be careful i don't want to okay well totally out. there we go so i'm back here so what you do is you go through here and you see uh there's some mods i made my sled beds for like a more directional control with my tractor wheels I talk about the efficiency of them here i'm actually unpacking worms in arizona 
I shipped the worms to Arizona, and I got there before the post office delivered them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, and, and I packed them and built uh, some cheap, using some cheaper totes than these, but I built some worm beds in this video. So you can see that two different ways and see what it looks like to be on the receiving end of getting worms I ship. So, and by the way, I have 40 acres in Arizona right now, so I'm going to be doing more out there in the not too distant future. So, so you, before you feed them, you got to you got to build the worm beds. You got to put find out what to use for bedding. And I, my favorite bedding is wood chips, but it takes them longer to break down. Horse manure is a pretty good bedding. Uh, it's got its drawbacks. These videos go all into that. What not to put in the worm bed used to be the best thing to put in the worm bed, and that was the gin trash or cotton holes out of the cotton gins. So I explained why it used to be the best thing and why now it's the worst thing. And here I go into feeding worms. They say, so you can feed worms your kitchen scraps. What most people need to feed is kitchen scraps. I did cover this in some of the earlier videos, like five key things for feeding, or for caring and taking care of worms. Uh, what you don't want to use is anything that's spicy because a worm's body is like the inside of your mouth. It's a mucous membrane, like soft tissue. So they're sensitive to uh, things that would burn in your mouth, for example. So don't feed them hot peppers, spicy food. Don't feed them a citrus feed because it's too acidic, or tomatoes. Besides that, tomato seeds will last in the survive inside the worm uh, castings. When you later plant, if you're trying to sell tomatoes, you don't know if it's the tomato seed you put in there or the one you uh, planted yeah. in there that's coming up. So I wouldn't put tomatoes in a worm bed. Uh, and, and just for sanitary reasons, I wouldn't put milk or meat products because it attracts too many other pests. It's not that the worms have a problem, it just attracts things you don't want in your bins. And that includes mm -hmm. animals. So uh, what I feed most, and, and hey, the manures are, are a feed too, but I also feed my worms some a non-GMO, uh, and, I, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm very organic. So not, see it says GMO free, said on the package there, GMO yeah. free uh, chicken laying, uh, uh, chicken starter feed basically. And here I talk about how to feed and water worms. And here I talk about insect control using dolomite, which is crushed limestone. And then I get into a couple other things like, you know, do you have pot worms? Uh, and I got to make a few other videos like this to add into the series. Uh, if you don't, if you don't have any baby worms, what you might need to do: some signs your worm beds too wet, how to keep them warm in the winter, how to brew. I got two worm tea brewing videos here. This one's got your smaller brews. It may show mm -hmm. my bucket. May, may show my pickle. I don't know. This is uh this is if you want to brew 250 gallons. Yeah. That's if you, if you really want a lot of worm tea, you might go swimming in that. No, I would. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go swimming. Uh, how to do a quick harvest. Uh, I built a trommel. This is a homemade trommel. Uh, you can buy these things for about three thousand dollars built by other people. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's that quick cast harvest. So that, so now we're getting into harvesting the product. So what I did, I, you know, I said, hey. What's the base of some worms? How do you build a bed? What do you put in the bed? How do you feed and care for the worms? And then I go into the hard, the products and the harvesting of them. And then I even covered, you know, tips for loading up horse manure. <laughs> so that's a pretty comprehensive set of videos. For, for it really is. So I, I try to cover the gauntlet. And one of these days I will probably do a course, online course for worm raising, worm farming, and particularly maybe a special course for those that want to do it commercially because i think the key thing you want to uh, watch about that's how you scope what you're doing so you don't mm -hmm. bite off too much as i'm all too often uh, led to do uh but i have other videos here like garden videos this garden video tab covers uh three different topic areas that will go there it covers uh raised bed gardens mm -hmm. and aquaponics and so there's a lot of the video devoted to just the preparation, I don't know, slowly, slowly, of the raised bed. And even when I show plant gardens, most uh, gardening YouTube channels don't go that much into, you know, raised bed preparation. Mm -hmm. But if you want to grow organically and you don't want to have to go to the store, this is what you really need to know. The planting the seeds part isn't the big deal. It's how you prepare your beds that you yeah. really need to pay a lot of attention to. There we go. Now you can see, start to see them. And see, I, my raised beds are lined with logs that I took off my property when I cleared it. Uh, those mm -hmm. logs are getting right down. I'll probably go back and use blocks soon. Uh, my, two of my favorite crops are turmeric and garlic. 
So I'm showing a lot of videos on those. Rattlesnake beans, I love those. And I'm a busy guy. A lot of times stuff gets away from me, and I'll show you how to top tomatoes when it's really too late. <laughs> uh, here's that busy. seed survival video here. There's mm -hmm. two videos from the DeVace family. I go in the garlic, growing it, taking care of it, pest, turmeric, sharpen the scythe. And I love to pull a bear, briars in my bare hand. Essential tools, I talk about uh, you go, the, the tools you need for the garden. And sometimes I use a little humor in talking about tools, as you see. <laughs> so, and then uh, here's the microgreens, how to grow microgreens live with no soil. And these videos are all made, you know, of greens I grew in my living room at the time. All those are living room videos. And here uh, I'm talking about aquaponics. Mm-hmm. That's my you know, this is really a wealth of information. I've never seen anybody go into such detail. And I, I, this, is, this is really fantastic. And it's so user friendly for somebody that's just starting out and the avid gardener that has been gardening for a very long time. So I love your website. Congratulations on this. And well, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I have a little fun with stuff, you know, even though I'm a doomsday prepper, I, I always like to maintain some humor, like uh, you can eat the maple seeds, so I call it eating maple helicopters. Have you had <laughs> your helicopter today? Uh, the number one wild edible, I say, eat the weed that's eating America. Believe it or not, that's kudzu. And then I talk really? about, yeah, kudzu's edible. It's in the bean family. It's about every, you can eat anything except the woody part of it. I didn't know that. See, I, I might have just saved your life. I, I think there's a <laughs> yeah. little bit of that. I, last time I looked in the Atlanta area, there was kudzu. In fact, I think <laughs> one of the wild edible videos I did, I, I filmed part of it outside of uh, uh, of a uh, huddle house or waffle house in Atlanta. <laughs> I, I was yeah, actually finding wild edibles in the lawn outside. I said, hey, you're probably better off eating what's growing in the lawn than you would eat what's growing in what they're selling inside. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Golden rod is amazing for your kidneys, while lettuce has got a lot of great painkiller properties to it. Dandelions are second to none for uh, both a lot of medicinal purposes and as an edible. And then, did you know you could eat trees? So eat your trees, please. And I'll show these kids at the table eating, right? Anyway, <laughs> That's part of my humor again. Eat your trees, please. <laughs> so, you know, beauty berries is a mosquito repellent, uh, which those, they grow a lot here in the south. Uh, mm -hmm. Persimmons, I love persimmons. It's one of my favorite fruit. And, oh, you know, we had the toilet paper preppers. They went nuts over toilet paper. Well, if you're in the right time of the year, there's no better toilet paper than the leaves of the oak leaf hydrangea plant. <laughs> I grew up using that. Lamb's quarters is wild spinach. You know, this is the, the Korean gorilla here, mystery mm -hmm. of gorilla. Uh, then I did a video on both narrow leaf and broad leaf plantain. This stuff is good for spider bites, bee bite stings, uh, uh, mosquito bites. It's uh, even been used for snake bite. So, you know, I never knew that. And when I was a girl, Every spring, I was like a, a puppy that would want to run out into the yard. And sure enough, I, of course, I'm running without my shoes on. And we had clover in our backyard. And I would step on a honeybee and get stung. And my father would use one of those leaves, one of the broad leaf plantain yeah, yeah. leaves. Sure enough, make a out of it. Yeah. He would put a paste of baking soda on the leaf and put it on the bottom of my foot and it would take the stinger out and you just pull the stinger out and you're, you're perfectly fine. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, okay. he, I think this is a video that part of it was filmed in somewhere in Georgia, I think around Atlanta. So, uh, and then Curly Doc. Well, eat Mo Curly Doc. He's got a stethoscope. Curly's <laughs> wearing a stethoscope here. So I had to find a picture of Curly wearing a stethoscope. Eat Mo. Curly Doc. Hey, like I said, get, that is actually a maypop there. I don't tell you what it is. Eat this. Well, they were very wild passion fruit. Maypops are great when, when they're ripe. They're, mm -hmm. they're very tasty. Uh, willow is a painkiller. Uh, I talk about various other. Uh, and I talk about 
I got a couple of videos on wild carrots, but you got to mm. uh, be able to identify them and distinguish them from hemlock, which is poisonous. So I got mm -hmm. two videos I've devoted to that topic. Uh, eat your briars. You know, just like eat your trees, eat your briars. Uh, most people think this is poison ivy or poison oak, and I got it my bare hand. I'm saying, no, this is not poison oak. Poison ivy or not? And the answer is no. So uh, mm -hmm. check that out because I go into some of that stuff that people need to know about. Why. I love sheep sorrel because it's got a nice tangy flavor. But tangy flavor also means it's oxalic acid. You don't want to eat too much of it. But it does taste great, and it's good in small quantities. This is growing out in my yard right now. It was near the end of the season for it. This is a, a late winter thing that grows here in the south a lot. It's called purple dead nettle. It's in the mint family. And here okay. I talk about greens and eating in the wintertime. Uh, uh, chickweed typically grows here in the south in the wintertime. And you can eat this uh, through most of our winter. And one thing you can always eat is the cambium, cambium level in, a layer inside of wood. You can get it out of twigs or even out of the tree trunks. And then making Tamiflu from sweet gum. The most mm -hmm. important video would be this one, how to filter and sanitize or purify and sanitize, which is two different things, water. And I show many methods to doing it here. This, this really should have been my most popular video, and that people need to consider this, because uh, this is what can make, you can only live three days without water, folks. You might live 30 days without food, and everybody's worried about the food. You need pure, pure clean water. So this is an important video to check out. You know what, I actually have a, a fellow producer, and we were talking about this show, and that was his main question. He said, you know, I'm going to try to catch the show, and um, and he wants me to make sure that I ask you, if we need to filter water, how? what is the best and easiest way to do so to make it drinkable? Well, the first thing is to get the bigger particles out of it. So that's why you might start with grasses and leaves on top of, uh, of whatever you're using to filter it. Now, in this video, I show you how to do it with a small plastic bottle, but you've got to run it through a bunch of plastic bottles. A larger container would be, lar would be better. Basically, you set it up with leaf matter in here, and you can see I've got gravel right there. I put a piece of gravel and I stop up the entrance, and then I got uh, sand. And I've got uh, basically charcoal down here. Don't buy, don't use charcoal you buy from the store. It's got chemicals in it. Make your own charcoal from a fire. Or if you can buy activated charcoal in a bag, it's, it's pure clean activated charcoal, like they typically use in water filters, that would be the best. But if you're out in the woods, you're not going to have that available to you. But you just take and make charcoal from the burnt wood in your campfire and crush it up. Uh, into a little into a powder, bind it into powder with rock, and that's how you get this. So uh, one thing you could do is you could take uh, five gallon buckets and and draw holes in them and uh, make and, and put them inside of each other. And each bucket would have one of these layers in. So that's one way to scale it up. Now I've also in this video I show the uh, uh, the Sawyer straws, the life straws, uh, things like Berkeley type water filters. Mine's a four pure the ceramic filter, and I talked about the merits of those and how you really can't get viruses out with a filter. That's why purifying water, which is making it clean, is different than sanitizing water, which is killing the bad stuff in it. I've even talked about in this video how to take a clear plastic bottle, the glass don't work for this, put it and put it out in the sun and let the UV kill the bacteria inside. That water's got to be purified because if it's got turbidity in it, the sunlight, the UV won't shine through it. And glass stops a lot of UV. That's why you actually want a plastic bottle for that. Now, this plastic bottle is a little bit small to use for this purpose, but, you know, yes, this is a torturous way to get there. It will work, especially if you boil water. Now, the cool thing about making your charcoal is you're also using a fire, which gives you a way to boil water. Uh, you can also use... Uh, uh, there, there are various tablets that you can put in your water iodine and various different things to, uh, or even a little bit of Clorox. I'll talk about how to dose the Clorox in your water uh, to, to sanitize it. So you do want your water sanitized. Uh, and one thing you hear in here in the background, you hear someone. Hello, I'm Greg Allison from Green Greg Garden and Worm Farm. Today I'm going to teach you how to filter and sanitize your water by using both natural methods 
with charcoal, sand, grass leaves, rocks, and, and a, like a, a two liter bottle. This is actually a, a 50 ounce bottle, a two liter bottle. A two liter bottle would probably be better than this. I will teach you how to use uh, rubber water jugs. And I'm going to discuss various other forms of water cutters that's on the market. And finally, stay tuned for my final tip. My final tip is going to be how to sanitize your water without using a fire or any chemicals like Thorox or iodine. We'll discuss that too. So for starters, we're going to start with this bottle here. And we're going to make it the container for a water filter. And here is one. Of the, this is my four pure. This is like the Berkeley filter. So I, I really think people uh, preference should have some of these filters. You should buy and carry filters for other things. Now that's an old video there. <laughs> so sometimes I like to cut up my videos. Uh, this is why uh, you know uh, what to do when they come for your food. This is a this was a live session I did recently down here. Uh, here I'm talking about power grid defense. I've got a lot of videos I talk about power grid defense. I've chaired two power grid defense conferences. I have chaired a space development conference, an international space development conference. I've done a lot of different things in my life. So, uh, and I've run for my life from rockets too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we were talking about that before the show, but while we're on YouTube, um, you have a very interesting video as we're talking about the world of prepping. Um, this is a bug out video, and I'd love for you to give the description, give the definition. What is having a bug out plan? What is that? Okay. Uh there's two different concepts of what to do when it hits the fan. One is called bug in, and one is called bug out. Bug in is you stay in your home. You try to tough it out where you're at. And for some people, seniors and other people, they may, they may have challenges bugging out. The uh, bug out is where you leave your premises and go to another place. Now, some people are very fortunate. They have had the time and money to build shelters, maybe dug in bunkers and places like that in a bug out location, or maybe it's just a homestead. But they got a place to go when it gets bad. Cities are going to be a very bad place to be. You do not want to be in a city when it hits the fan because you've got a food desert full of uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and in the case of a mega city, maybe up to 20 million or more people. Right. In an in, in asphalt concrete construct with very little means for growing food. That's a whole lot of hungry people without any food. Based on a situation like that, you look like a pork chop. You mm -hmm. don't be the pork chop. <laughs> or we also <laughs> refer to that as long pork. Don't be long pork. You want to get out to the cities. That would be my advice. So and I've had people say, well, what's your best advice for, for bugging out? And one person said in Las Vegas, Nevada, I said, get out of town. <laughs> get out of Las Vegas. <laughs> That's my best advice. You know, that was, I was honestly brutal with it. Uh, cities are going to be a bad place to be. Very bad. The mayhem will be off the charts. It doesn't mean some people won't survive. But um, your prospects are very, very, very dismal. Uh, and and you're, you're probably going to see the most horrible thing that you could never want to imagine. So I don't even want to talk about that, except get out. <laughs> so right. that, would, that would be a case where you want to bug out. Okay. So now uh, what about location? Well, what location is it? also drives whether you want to stay in place or leave. Mm -hmm. Some locations are good and some are bad. If you live in an area that, you know, what, there's different kind of threats we could have. It might just be economic threat. The economy goes in the tank. We could lose our power grid. That's what I worry about the most because there's so many ways that we could lose our power grid and the consequences are horrific beyond imagination because our electric power is the key Achilles heel for all of our other political infrastructure systems, mm -hmm. such as banking such as water, you know, all the water is pumped by electrical pumps. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's gasoline. Don't be no communications. Run. Yeah. You won't be a uh, fuel, right? Oh, well, I drive my car. I'll be fine. Well, uh, it. it takes electricity to pump fuel, to pump water, to pump 
we use it uh, for our, in our bank accounts. It's, uh, we're, we're totally dependent these days on, you know, well, there was once a time that banks kept everything on a paper ledger, but you know, now everything is computerized. Well, when computers go down, your money goes poof. Um, mm -hmm. At least what's in the bank. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of things to, to consider about that. Uh, but here's what the, the, there was congressional, congressional task force uh, uh, the MP Congressional Task Force that briefed Congress, I think about 14 years ago. And what they had, their analysis had told them that within a year of having no electricity in the United States, nine out of 10 people would perish from societal collapse. A lot of that will be spread of disease. And of course, there will be some mayhem in people that are bad actors too. So there's a lot to contend with in a situation like that. But I think they, by and large, figure people in the rural areas would be a lot better off than what they really probably want to be because I've surveyed farms and found that maybe at best only one out of eight farmers are, is really growing a garden of any consequence. So mm -hmm. a lot of farmers are going to be starving to death on their farms. I did a video on that too. Uh, so why farmers will starve to death? Why preppers will starve to death? I've, I've covered these things in a number of videos. Uh, so if you look at this, I covered many different threats. So the breakdown is one threat. Well, a tsunami is a potential threat. A tsunami can occur from a volcanic uh, uh, explosion in an ocean, from a huge earthquake landslide within the ocean itself, from uh, an asteroid strike in the Earth, because the Earth is mostly water, so the most likely air to get hit is going to be the ocean that can cause an enormous uh, tsunami. And unfortunately today, the Russians have developed a weapon system called the Poseidon 6. No, the mm -hmm. Poseidon or Status 6, excuse me. It's called the Poseidon Torpedo or Status 6. It is a nuclear engine powered torpedo with an infinite range of how far it can go. It is sized to be able to carry the largest nuclear device they've ever devised, which is twice as big as the largest one ever tested a 100 megaton uh, SAR bomb. Wow. 50 megaton was the largest one tested. Uh, and they uh, have even talked about uh, cobalt salt in some of these devices so that they will put out very radioactive water. Uh, and they've talked, they, they've talked about putting two megaton warheads in them too. A two megaton warhead would take you out a large city or more, a few cities maybe, with a huge tidal wave. The 100 megaton Sarbama could possibly take out an entire coastline with a ginormous radioactive tsunami that would sweep miles inland. So this is not a pretty picture. Uh, three of those mm -hmm. could basically divide the United States access to, to the ocean, but one off the Pacific, one off the Atlantic, one the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the remnant of the United States to be landlocked. That was an EMP explosion that would take out our power grid. America would be in a very bad situation. And a lot of people don't realize is Russians have developed a uh, EMP super weapon, which has uh, five times, well, four times more power uh, on the ground than we built our, uh, in terms of radiated electricity, uh, like 200,000 watts per meter, kilo, yeah, per meter, as opposed to the 50,000 50, watts per meter that were originally hardened or mill hard facilities. To. Not all military systems are, are hardened either. But that's what you would use to respond to uh, an attack like that. So that you know that theoretically they wouldn't want to attack us because it'd be mutually assured destruction. But they might be able to short circuit our mutually assured uh, destruction, and we might not be able to respond at all. If they get that idea, they might think, "Well, why don't we just take America out and get them out, get us out, get them out of our way, and the world's ours." Mm -hmm. <coughs> that's it's a temptation you don't want them to have. It's why we need a hard enough power grid, but right now we've got that. So, I, and, and we need to do more work and hard and, and put redundancy, more redundancy uh, into our nuclear command and control system structure. So, sure. uh, these are things that need to be done. If, if I were President of the United States or if I was put in charge of those kind of projects, I know what I'd be focusing on. So, in any event, uh, if you go through this video, if you may play part of it, I started out with some of these things. So you want to be over 500 feet above uh, sea level, I would say, at least. Okay. You want to be away from your cities. You want to be away from a nuclear power plant. You want to be away from military bases, which are all targets for a nuclear war. 
And I got another video very much like this where it's, it's called nuclear bug gut. It goes more into the nuclear aspects of it, radiation and so forth. So big map of the United States here. Some things to consider is you want to be in a place that's just how you can there. You want to be above sea level. You want to be, uh, I would say, first and foremost, you want to be above 500 foot sea level because you can have tsunamis. If one of your, uh, if one of your, it hits the fan scenarios is that you have a tsunami because of a major earthquake, a landslide, asteroid hitting the earth, or the Russians now have a bomb called the Tsar bomber, which is put into a torpedo, and they're building these. Okay, so I'll explain all this. I'm getting redundant. Sorry about that. Torpedoes. Torpedoes. You want me to play this, or are you going to skip ahead, or what do you want me to do? Well, I think we can skip ahead from this one. You had uh, filled us in pretty well with that. Um, here are some of the shorelines to, to avoid, and it also goes on the west coast. Whoops, we got to add here. <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. So that shoreline, that was going to be my next question, which is, all right, so you're giving us, you know, 500 spots. And let it play through it on skip. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. So all right. I, I was also showing growing areas here where uh, you've got, you know, this green line. Green means grow. You can see what you can see where I, I, I also uh, drew around the western shoreline where you wouldn't want to be here, and uh, a little bit up the middle of the river here, uh, you can get slosh effects in the lakes. Uh, so what I've done here is I have shown the, the, a green grow line, which uh, is more productive for growing food. So being in this area has actually got its advantages when it comes to growing food. I'll skip ahead. Uh, and I'm starting to show the heavy population centers here. That's what I'm beginning mm -hmm. to draw circles around. And I'm saying, don't go there, stay out. So I highly right. encourage everybody to watch the whole video because we'll, we'll just skip ahead. You see, they start oh, multiplying, you know, various reasons. I go into various reasons why you don't want to be in one spot or another. Oh my goodness. Okay. So good. Oklahoma looks good. These green the greens are good. Anything that's green is good, red is bad. Kind of like green light, red light. So I'm I'm going into why I think these green areas are good, including, you know, uh Ozarks. Uh Austin, I might make that a little greener now since they are working a harder power grid, but still they can't produce their food. Oh yeah, this is a Yellowstone proximity here, which mm -hmm. worried me a little bit. This is a huge area that's going to have a lot of fallout from uh, any nuclear attack on the uh, missile bases and the SAC center up here. Oh yeah, let's see, Utah is looking green. So you know, I've got definitely green areas on here. Yeah. So, and I go through various other things. Uh, I'm crossing out some of the other countries around us. I explain that in here. So as you can see, as I go in the video, there's more and more detail, more and more explanation. Uh oh, I drew a skull and crossbones down here. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like Los Angeles is the last place you want to be. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be in Los Angeles. I actually did a video just on that. Why? You got about 2 million people in this space. I actually did a special video on Los Angeles. Uh, 2 million people in this space. And if you have enough earthquakes and those freeways break down, they're basically trapped there between the ocean and the mountains. So mm -hmm. that's not going to be a good place to be. And I even talked about some other countries. And so, I, you know, I kind of travel around the world there a little bit in that video uh, using Google Maps. So that kind of takes you to that. Do you want to see this uh, first 24 hour in case of a nuke video now? Or you want to talk about do that was the other video that I was watching that I found to be very interesting. It it is the so it says first twenty four hours what to do after EMP or getting nuked with Stacy, which is a guest of yours on your show, and she has a very interesting point that you had mentioned on the show is a uh, a pivotal point. It is something that we really need to be thinking about and have a plan. Yeah, in fact, what people don't think about and uh, talk about on prepping channels these days are as the kids. <laughs> well, here right. we go. Right. So that's the get home for us. I'm here, secure the property. And for you out there, um, whoever is closest to the children, if your kids are in public school, you have to have that plotted out. Okay? 
Um, if, if the wife is gone for the day, she's driving 50, 60 miles away, husband is 10 miles away from the kids. All right, today, dad gets the kids. But on a normal, on a normal day, if mom is within three miles of the kid, mom gets the kids. Ride bike, whoever you have to get there to get in there and get those kids. Now, be warned. The schools may be on lockdown and tell you you can't get your kids. And that's a fact. And there's another possibility, because I've talked to teachers, that they'll just abandon the kids. Because you got to remember, these teachers and these administration people, you know, their parents, they got families of their own, they may not stay. So your priority at that point, whoever is closest to those children is to get to that school and get your children. And you get them any way, shape, or form that you can get them. And, that's, and I very mean, important. that's a very important thing that don't get mentioned by them. And that's why it's good to have a woman on here that's ladies' perspective. <laughs> and Absolutely. That is a very strong point. Uh, that's right. That should be your top. There you go. Do you want to see more of that? Or is that, that, that gets your yeah. point? No, I think that gets the point across. And then I have a few other questions. Um, but I don't think that we need the video, but thank you for pulling that up. That is an extremely strong point. However, I believe, um, I have a couple of kids in school. Some of this, I feel like we can feel the escalation to a degree at which I'm no longer going to be comfortable sending my kids off to school. I can, I can agree with that. The world is getting crazy right now. It's beyond crazy. First, we had the pandemic. Right. And now we've got, uh, we're in a very tense situation with Russia. We could find ourselves in any time, like maybe next month, in the same kind of situation with China. Yeah. Uh, North Korea is, is popping off missiles. Uh, you know, one time we just all we faced is Russia, but now we got Russia, North Korea, and China. And who knows what Iran's going to be doing. Yeah, I was about to say, Middle East is not happy with us either. No, no, no. And Iran calls the United States the great state. They don't call Israel the great state. They call the United States the great state. And it's mm -hmm. probably because we kicked out their elected president and, and put a, a, a tyrant in charge of him, the Shah of Iran. And you know, we, we've had a history of doing things that we ought not have done. We pay for it later. And uh, so all the chickens had to come home to roost yet. So we've got to be, I don't want to get into the politics of it. Mainly what I try to do is tell people this is more and more reason why you need to be prepared for in crazy bad times which can fall upon us. We know through the geological record that bad times happen just through weather and geological events. Whether it be a space weather event like the Carrington event, uh, nuclear uh, I mean, a uh, solar chrome mass ejection, whether it be from a uh, volcano going off, an asteroid strike, the cycles of weather. Uh, there are there are catastrophic things that can come to our world. And, but even since that, just on a local level, we had tornadoes here. I had an EF5 miss my home by a little, just a little bit over a mile back in 2011. It took out a lot of the high power transfer lines out from the Browns Ferry nuclear power plant and we were at without power uh, for about a week here in some places a lot longer and while a lot of people were suffering you know I already had the food I had a little gas power stove I had the generator I had the propane I was cooking and eating and then listening to what was going on around through my you know, battery powered radio I already had all this stuff I was already a prepper so it was like hey no big deal it's no might be a little inconvenient, but hey, I didn't have to go into work. It was I was getting to stay at home and, uh, and kind of keep up with things. So I used that time. Yeah. Here's the funny thing. My worms actually arrived the day before that tornado hit, my very first worms. And so I used that time to work on my worm farm. So, you know, for me, it was uh, not a bad deal. For some people, it was, you know, pandemonium and they were scared and a lot of stuff was bad news for them. But, you know, I was ready. I was prepared. So we all tell people, don't be scared, be prepared. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm going to say it again, too. Don't be scared, be prepared. Because in this day and age, it just feels like the human psyche of the average American is not where it needs to be for survival. 
because all that fear and the freaking out and the pandemonium, I think, has a high mortality rate. Well, well panic is one of the most dangerous things you can do. When people panic, they're not thinking. And I tell people, if you lose your head, you might really lose your head. Mm-hmm. So you know, you, you need to stop, take stock of things, and think. Thinking right. will save you a lot faster, usually, than, than pandemonium. Uh, people make a lot of stupid mistakes when they panic. So, I, you know, I, I, I watch one YouTube channel that says, don't panic now, but I'll tell you when to panic. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> never panic. Never panic. That don't mean you shouldn't get, a little, get in a hurry sometimes. I mean, you know, there is that flight or fight syndrome. You know, if, right. if you got a tiger chasing you, you, you know, you might not want to stand still, although you can't outrun a tiger. If you run from it, he's going to equate you to be afraid. But if he's already running at you, you probably, if you're standing there, you better have something to jab him with, or maybe you need somewhere to duck that he can't get to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you better take action in that case. I can see the flight or, 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 flight, or flight there. But, uh, or fight or flight, excuse me. Uh, but, you know, the, just panicking is not going to serve you. No, absolutely not. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time this evening. You've shared so much, and you share so much out there with the world. So, you know, again, on your website, the donate button is active. And if someone was to donate towards your cause, what does that money go towards? It goes to operate my farm. Uh, but I, you know, I've got something else that I, I, I have a long-term goal. Maybe I should do a share again. I've got a long-term goal. There's something I want to build that will be a game changer in the way we live in our world. Let's see if I can find it. Let me get out of this video. I'll try to go back up to my channel here. Now, one thing again, this the channel is Green Gregs. Mm-hmm. It's right there. It is Green. Go to YouTube and just type in Green of Space and Jerry G S and apostrophe. But if you ever want to really find all the videos on the channel, just click on videos and you can scroll through and you can sort them by the usually the default is the newest is up front. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, here's the status of my worms. I'm going to be selling worms again. So if you want to see what my worms look like right now, click on that video. Uh, and then you can, uh, to, to, to look for a video, once you're in the videos, sort of sees you this, like we'll dip other tabs in there. Just click this. And let's see, what was I going to show you? I want to show you a video. Oh, yeah. Universal Habit app. Universal oh. Habit. Interesting. So I've been working on this concept for a home you can live in and make a living out of. Uh-huh. Oh, this is down in this is in South Georgia. You know where that is? That's Plains, Georgia. <laughs> Supposed to be a, a peanut with a Jimmy Carter smile. Oh, yes. okay, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> I wasn't and, sure if that was uh, a di- head of a dinosaur or what that was. Uh, if, you rem- if you remember the seventies, you'd remember that peanut back then. But anyway. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm not a Carter fan, but uh, it was it made for an interesting thing because he started humble from a small town, rural town in Georgia and became president of the United States. So mm-hmm. this this is a Mars re, uh, simulation, actually, of my habitat concept there. But this is the one I like. This is Green Graves Universal Habitat. The whole point of this is a home you can live in, make a living out of, draw all your food in, and uh, it would really cut down on infrastructure needed for floors oh, about uh, the living area, like a, a foot thick or better. So what you would do? Oh, got to add. Shoot. <laughs> well, at least it's an natural greenhouse garden, right? Yeah, uh, it's applicable. So if you could go in here and look at this, this is the outdoor. I actually hired a uh, architect to make this concept look pretty for me and to do uh-huh. the architectural work on it. And she is based out of uh, Tunisia, Tunis, Tunisia, the young girl who was my architect in this. So this is a home that you can grow. This is like the DeVace family uh, with growing on top of your roof instead of just in the backyard. So the whole footprint of the home is a tenth of an acre. And this is wow. a concept for a side view looking at this thing. 
But this one is actually drawn to be, well, that one's actually for a Venus habitat, believe not. So I've come up with the concepts for, for how to put these basically anywhere in the world on Mars or even Venus. I've got a concept, yeah, Venus is 800 degrees hot on the surface, but the, if you're 30 miles in the atmosphere, it's uh, actually room temperature and the pressure's the same as Earth and the gravity's the same, unlike Mars. So, oh, you're kidding, I didn't know that. Yeah, so this is this is my Venus habitat. This is, this is the beginnings of architectural work on it. That's the Mars habitat, which is a sim. And I'm just showing various calculations and things. Oh yeah, that I think calculation is showing how. Uh, yeah, she's she's my architect. Mm -hmm. uh, where's it at? Oh, yeah. I mean, it I'm looks so lush and wonderful. I love it. Well, the cool thing is, you can grow all your food right there at home. It's all mm -hmm. fresh. It's all the optimal nutrition because food starts losing its vitamin content after you harvest it so this is fresh food it doesn't have any chemicals in it it doesn't require fuel and refrigeration to transport it so it's from uh you know uh from garden to fork basically ripped the mouth right there in your house in your home uh it's got huge advantages to growing this way uh and you could actually grow everything a family of four would need so this home is sized for family of four in a family of four size garden on the tenth of an acre, and but it's actually more than because the way I've, I've got a basement in here, so it actually be, could be far more productive than that. And you can have shops in there where you could produce things in your shop, uh, including you could have like anything from a potter wheel, the loom, the server farm, uh, you know, just whatever you, you're inclined to do that way. You can also add mushrooms to grow in there or a worm farm, uh, internal aquaponics. Uh, you could have, so you could actually have a lot more growing area. Uh, now, and if, if you don't you, want to grow, if you don't have a green thumb, we'll eventually have uh, 3D printer top robotics that could grow your food for you. Okay. Now, is this a closed structure? Yes, it is. It is. So now, what about your pollinators? How uh, you, can, you can open it up and let pollinators in, and you could okay. also... Uh, network these if you're in a community to have pollinators come through them. But you, know, you would only have to open it when you wanted the pollinators in there. Uh, this is actually big enough. You could have some pollinators resin in the home itself. So here I'm talking about takes 1,996 uh, pounds of food to feed the average American. A lot of people live on much less. And so it, this goes into how much you can actually grow on the tenth of an acre. Uh, the DeVace family has produced over 7,000 pounds of food. Uh, how you could actually increase that if you're like in a Mars, a Venus habitat, by putting in extra CO2. Uh, you know, going back to my Venus stuff. There's the Earthship homes, showing an analogy to that. So there's, you know, I cover a lot of stuff in this, but I actually want to build, build a prototype of this. Maybe a couple mm -hmm. of them, one here and one in Arizona. So right now, uh, my farm exploits are really building blocks for this. As I'm at, they're all building everything I'm doing with worm farming and, and microgreens and aquaponics and the raised bed gardens. And this is mostly raised bed that the base family grew everything in raised bed gardens. So it's just primitive raised bed gardens. Uh, you would also think about a home like this is going to have enough thermal mass that uh, the whole idea is you won't have to heat and cool it like we do regular homes. It will actually, you can actually cool it from the ground, uh, air pulled up from the ground through heating the air in the greenhouse portion, and you can vent it out and pull cool air through your house to cool it. And then you could uh, you could use the greenhouse, the thermal mass to heat your home. Uh, you, so you would, and you wouldn't even need a greenhouse really. The thermal mass is going to take care of most of your needs for temperature control. So wow. the, it's uh, uh, you're going to, and, and the, the homes heat home home heat and home cooling are huge energy cons uh, consumers in America. Uh, you're not gonna need a lot of electrical power when you don't have to heat or cool your home or if you're using solar to heat your water for hot water, which I advocate that too. And uh, if you're growing all the food you, you need out of your home, you're gonna eliminate a lot of the needs for trucking and refrigeration. Plus, mm -hmm. if you 
you're making a living out of your home, either through the food or through some other industry, you're running out of your basement, then, uh, or like I am, I'm making a living right here. You can, we can do a lot of stuff these days remotely. Um, my friends, you're not going to need so much driving. You're not, in fact, our society won't need the highways, the pipelines. You basically, you're harvesting rainwater off your roof. You can get all the water you need, really, from doing that. Those little earthship houses in the desert of uh, Taos, uh, uh, New Mexico are getting most of their water from just a subsection of the roof where it only rains 10 inches a year. So uh, we can do a lot with recycling water. And they don't really truly recycle. They just put it through a four-stage use. As a space guy, I'm more interested in recycling it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and aquaponics also uses far less water than regular growing. So there's a lot we can do not using the stuff we have. Let me stop the share here. There's a lot we can do that would really, really almost eliminate our footprint in the environment. We could almost totally eliminate our footprint. And you could, the UN at one time was saying it would take, um, the Earth's population would probably peak at 9 billion people. And some are saying it'll go higher than that. And they think the population will actually start dropping. And we see in industrialized societies that we're, we're, we don't have replacement population. We're just not reproducing ourselves. That may actually be an issue. But I could take nine billion people, put them in homes like this where they're producing everything they need in their homes, and put it all in the area. How much area do you think it would take to cover, take care of the world's population like that? Oh, uh, I have no idea. A lot less than what we're using now. How about an area the size of Texas and New Mexico? That's or, right. or half of Alaska. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's all it takes, really. I wouldn't put everybody in the same spot, <clears throat> but just but, see, they tell us there's not enough room on our planet. We don't have enough room. There's so many people that you, you can't do this, you can't do that, we can't have this. We can't. You would be living in a standard of living that would be equal or exceed the standard of living you're living today mm -hmm. and having almost no impact on the environment. So, we might have to strip off coal fields and set coal on fire just so we don't go into uh, an ice age. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh my goodness. Wow, that that's phenomenal. And that it would is... be far more economical. Uh, these homes could be built. You don't have to have the roof girdered in steel and glass, uh, especially if you're in the tropics. You don't even need it. You might be putting up shade cloth at most. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no reason that poor people couldn't live this way. Uh, you know, there's no reason that we couldn't build these homes through you know, like barn raisings like people used to do. Uh, the walls could be made out of sandbags, or they could be 3D printed with a 3D printer concrete made, you know, very little labor. Because if you need less labor, 3D print it. If labor is not dejected, but but if you, you, you don't want to have to go buy materials, you can use old tires to build a pound the sand and dirt mm -hmm. into the tires, and you're recycling. Or sandbags. That's one of my. I think sandbags is less labor intensive than tires if you're going to be filling them with dirt. But so there's many approaches you can go about building a home like this. My philosophy, though, is give you enough area to grow your food in it and to have a sufficient thermal mass that you can, which you know, walls like 18 to two inches to 18 to 24 inches thick so that you don't have to pr provide a lot of additional heat and cooling. You could do it mm -hmm. all through. Uh, the combinations of greenhouse and uh, pulling the air through the ground. So uh, mm. there's so much we can do to live better. I don't want to make a now a lot of people come with a concept like this. That, oh, then we need to force everybody to do this or that. That's how a lot of people. Think. I don't believe in that kind of philosophy. I say this: Let's come up with an idea. Let's make it so beautiful, so great that people couldn't imagine that they'd want to be anywhere else. Right. Exactly. I think exactly. they, okay, more power to them. But that is my philosophy. I think about using bottle walls and different techniques. These could be very artistic, very beautiful, very mm -hmm. affordable. Uh, your energy bill will be zip. Uh, you don't have to drive all over the place. You may not even need a car or insurance or paying gas. And just think if you eliminate the cost of gasoline, electric, your electric bill, your uh, Oh yeah, you eliminate your food bill, so your electric bill, your food bill, your your uh, insurance for your car. Uh, just think of all the money you don't need on those things. Right, exactly. It's it's astronomical. 
Yeah. I think that's, that's fantastic. I mean, congratulations on just bringing it thus far. And the renderings are gorgeous. I just, I love it. I can't wait to see where you go with it. And, um, and you know, this, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I think we could go on for more and more hours. And I'd love to have you back on the show again very soon. Greg, I, I just, I can't thank you enough for everything that you've shared with us this evening and what you're doing. You're helping people get started. And, you know, in the topic of sustainability and prepping and everything that could happen, it's coming mainstream, as you had mentioned earlier. It's in our faces. We need to be prepared. And I love what you're doing. Thank you so much for having those videos accessible to people for free. Exactly. Oh, they got to put up with a few commercials, but you do that in any medium anyway. So the cool thing is I'm trying to put a lot of information and content out there that help people. And a lot of my videos are about what's going on in the world, but I do that so that people, people will focus on the points I'm making about what's going on in the world. It's really not about that. It's really about preparing. I put that out there so that you'll know that you need to prepare so you can share them with your family members so they see how crazy the world is. You know, you know, don't pay no attention. Don't pay much attention now that if I'm, you know, you know, if you look like I'm well way in toward one side of some spectrum, I'll ignore all that. It's really about preparing, getting people yeah. prepared. I hope it don't hit the fan. But a lot of what I differ from a lot of prepper channels is that usually at the end of my videos, I'm talking about things that they can do. My viewers can do is preventative actions to try to keep it from hitting the fan. I've actually started mm -hmm. another group called Freedom Restoration Foundation, and we got a website with an action center telling people how they can contact some people exactly all the steps to contact the Congress critters so they can do things to help us stay out of these things. I've chaired two power grid defense conferences. I'm involved in two national level power grid defense organizations to try to uh, get the right attention to securing our grid, uh, mm -hmm. safe in our nuclear power plants. I got, I, have, I got too many irons in the fire. That's why I can use some help. <laughs> And that's why we're building these organizations. You'll find links in my videos about how to build these organizations. I'm trying to build a network of survival tribes to make it through all this stuff. So my, my hope is first that we keep things that we don't have a nuclear war, that we can prevent it. Secondly, yeah. that we can prevent our power grid going down. But those, there's still a huge chance that things will go awry. For that reason, we do need to prepare. And if it does hit the fan, the objective is this, to be able to stand up, shake it off, and build a better world. That's right. That's, That's right. And I believe we can do that. I believe we can make this world better if we can just keep ourselves from blowing it up. You know, exactly. Amen to that. The first major exactly. planet of the apes, the astronauts come back, and they think they're on the foreign planet, another star <laughs> system. The very end of the Navy, they go out to the beach, and, they walk, and, and, and Carlton Heston's character, uh, he looks up and sees, the Statue of Liberty and you know and runs and he just pounds his fist and says, Man, he's mad because he knew we blew it up. <laughs> so let's right. stop that from happening. That's my first choice. An ounce of prevention is worth a gallon of cure. Let, let's stop the madness. But if it does come to pass, let's at least be able to be able to build a better world. I prefer to rebuild this world, make it better if we can. But I, I close a lot of my videos this way, especially my live sessions. Not all of them, but a lot of them. I try to do this. I try to tell people to follow. I say, as light dispels dark, love dispels hate. Go out and shine your love light into the world. Mm, beautiful. Beautiful. And with that, everybody, I want to thank you so much for watching. This has been the Caffeinated Cooper Show with Greg Allison, which is greengregs.com and Green Greggs on YouTube. Make sure you like, you subscribe, watch all the videos, and you are going to be so filled with so much education about what we need to do, what we need to be prepared with. And as always, we are blessed. You are blessed. <laughs>